Hey Dan, I am Ricky Nord. Uh, you best probably know me as an actor from EastEnders, but um, you might know me also as a presenter, you might know me as a dancer from back in the day, but just an all round good guy and entertainer. When I was very, very young, um, my nan, I used to dance around the house all the time, uh, whether it was Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley or, you know, uh, James Brown. Um, and she was like, you know, this, this kid's got way too much energy. So she used to take me down to Soho, uh, where all the dancers, the break dancers, used to take out their mats and they used to do showcases when I was a kid. And I, I, when I say a kid, I'm talking like threes, you know, just, you know, threes and fours, maybe four at the height of the age, you know, no older than that. And um, she used to take me down and I was fascinated by it. I used to sit there and watch the breakers do their thing and flip and do their legs and, you know, and, uh, you know, do all the shapes and stuff. And I used to sit there as a kid and just be kind of like, you know, in awe of them. And then the dancers would see me there. I don't know. I don't know whether I got pointed at by my nan or not. I was, because my eyes were here, but then they would see me there and they'd be like, all right, come little man, come little man. And I'd be like, yeah. And, you know, I'd seen them spin on their head. So what I would do as a kid, would like, I'd put my head down on the mat and just run around my head. But the crowd would go mad, do you know what I mean? The crowd would go wild. So like, I, that was my first kind of taste and dip into, in, into performance and kind of, and, and dance, you know? Uh, so that, that, that was the first thing that kind of got me in at a really, really young age. And then I just tried to kind of keep it going. It, it simmered for a long while. My nan went into hospital, she came out. Um, she had like a bypass and stuff, so that meant no more trips to Soho. Um, so dance, you know, it simmered for a while, but then I got into primary school and there was a dance competition, and a street dance competition, and I was like, well, yeah, well, let's do it, you know? And um, that got me back in. Um, a, very, uh, a guy you may know, uh, Cat B, or Cat from MTV, MTV Base, um, he was my teacher, he was my dance teacher, he, he taught a group called Rough Stuff at Forest Gate Youth Centre and um, I was part of that crew as a, as a youngster and that was my first kind of foray into dancing and performing on stage and you know going around and learning routines and stuff like that. Um, so yeah that's pretty much how I started. When I started acting it was maybe uh, just slightly later, just maybe 11s. So I, I went into Rough Stuff maybe 10, 11, so the drama maybe came a, a year later, like 11 or 12, so I can remember them, them times, where I just started going to after school drama club at, uh, at a place called Tom Allen, which is no longer, it doesn't exist no more, they've turned it into a Methodist church, yeah, so, you know, when, when I drive, when we drive past there, on a Sunday, you see everybody coming out and like, you know, everybody's praising. Where before we used to come out and like, we'd be like, you know, improvising and we'd be busting joke or we'd be running our scripts and stuff like that. But everyone's praising. But you know, it's good to praise. It's good to praise. So um, yeah, man. So that's how I got into performing, like dance. And then that was my first kind of thing into drama. And once I got into drama, I just kind of loved it. I loved that you could, you could be a hundred different people. You know, you, you, wasn't, you wasn't defined by your age, your race, your, your, your where you was born, where you grew up. None of these things mattered in acting. Um, you, could, you, you, could, you could be anybody and do anything, and I really was attracted to that. You know, um, I, could, I could play a dance. I, you know, I had love for dance growing up, but I, I could play a dancer, but I could also play like a spy, or I uh, could also play like, you know, you know, um, I don't know, like a, a, a comedy movie, you know, Rolling with Eddie Murphy or something like that. That was things that I was thinking of back in the day. And, and, and um, so, so that was my thing. When I, when I looked at acting, I was just like, wow, I can pretty much do everything that I enjoy in, in this one field. And I just, once I dove in, I dove in. And that was me. Wow, what was I like at school? Well, um, it, was, it was a mixed bag. I, I was a bit shy to begin with. Um, but yeah, it was uh, when I got into primary school. Um, this is when the dance competition came up. It was like, like I said, when I was maybe about ten, or yeah, towards the age of ten. I can't remember what year that is in primary school right now. But um, it was around that time that the dance competition came up, and that was through. It was through the primary school. Cat, Cat's mum used to work as a dinner lady at my primary school, and I was always Mrs. Boyce. Love to Mrs. Boyce always. Um, 
and we was always good with each other. Like, I always had love for Mrs. Boyce. Boyce always had love for me, like, from dinner line. Like, I didn't used to take the birdies in, you know, she used to blow the whistle for dinner line, and I used to be like, good, you know what I mean? Everybody else would be like this, yeah, let me get in, let me, I'd be like, this man, just, just, just let me get my cake and custard. I'd be a happy guy, let me get my cake and custard. So, I always had a good relationship with her, and then Kat came into the school to do, um, like, a couple of dance classes, and, um, that's when I kind of jumped back in and yeah, he took me on and we, we done really well at the dance competition. We won gold uh, that year. Yeah, it was a metropolitan dance competition. I don't know why the police were running the dance competition, but we was in it and we loved it. Thank you, they should bring it back. It helped communities, you know, it just helped a little bit of community between young ones and police, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it was an amazing experience. And then after that, I started dancing with him um, at Forest Gate Youth Centre. And that really kind of helped to bring out my personality. I was, I, I was more me in the dance circle and going to First Gate Youth Centre than I was in primary school, you know, first year of secondary school. Um, I, could, I, I, was, I was more open to express. I, I, it, it felt um, more secure to express yourselves and bust stroke what you wanted to bust stroke on. And, you know, because when, when I started dancing, um, it was considered gay by a lot of people, or it was ridiculed as gay, you know what I mean? If you was dancing, or if you called yourself a dancer, then he was like, oh, you're gay, you know what I mean? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, I went to Rokeby School, you know, but and Sarah Bunnell was around the corner at that point, you know, Sarah Bunnell was a girl's school, and, you know, like, because of dance, I got to hang out with a lot of girls, and a lot of guys were jealous about that, do you know what I mean? So I don't know, there was a lot of ridicule, I don't know where it came from, but like I said, there was this kind of stigma about dance when I was growing up, but I just did not care. You know, I really didn't care. School was okay, but it, it, it wasn't really my bag, you know? It wasn't really the best place for me. It was cool, I got through it. Um, you know, I got okay marks, uh, we bust some joke along the way. Uh, I've still got one good friend from there. You know what I mean? My best boy, Danny. So like, you know, like, so, you know, there's at least some good that came from there. Um, but I, where I really found myself and where I really found my voice was in class. And then once I left school and kind of went to college, that was where I could kind of rebuild myself and start again and kind of go, okay, well, you might have known me as one thing or one person in school, but now that doesn't exist no more. I can go into college and kind of be the guy that I want to be, you know? And where I was doing performing arts, everybody was in the same kind of boat. So everybody loved performing arts, whether it was singing, whether it was dancing, whether it was acting. Everybody loved that. And with that energy, you know, it, like I say, it helps to build you up. It helps you to be free in, in them points and in, in, in places. And it helps you forget about the negativity that surrounds you, you know, because you push all your energy and your focus into what you love. When did acting become serious? It was, it was, I want to, I want to kind of say truthfully, like from, from, from the get go, really. To me, to me, I, I started, there was classes and, you know, we'd do shows. And I, I remember always chatting to my mum and always, you know, saying that I need to do this because you know, I'm going to be an actor and I need, to do, I need to do this now because this will help me later. And I always had that mindset. I, I, I don't know where it came from, but I, I was always like, okay, like I used to practice my, my signature as a kid because I was like, yeah, I'm going to, have to, I'm going to have to have an autograph. You know, like I, I just, and it, it got to the point where I kind of, there, there was a bit of pressure because my dad didn't really think that there was any way that you could make money from dancing or performing or, you know, I'm an East London boy from Forest Gate, you know, my, my, my dad is Bethnal Green boy, you know, he's, he's, he's grown up uh, like odd carrying and scaffolding and in the building trade and, you know, he's like, get a, get a trade, son, you know, which is, which is, which is what you want to kind of, you, you want a guarantee of your, of your, of your, your kid working. So, with that, it was almost like a, a motivation to be like, okay, cool, well, this is what I'm going to have to make. I'm going to have to make it happen. I'm going to have to make it happen. So every, every show and every next performance, whatever it was, I was always striving for the next thing to make sure that, you know, I could prove to all the elders that it, it was worth my time and, you know, I am going to do something with this and I am going to make something of it, you know, so, 
Yeah, that's when it, yeah, it was always serious. So EastEnders came about, um, I, okay, so I've got to go a little bit back before I go forward. Okay, so when I was about, I want to say 18, I want to say 18, 19, um, I'd done two years in college, BTEC National, I was going into the HNC, uh, Barking College, big up Barking College, big up Mr. McDermott, John McDermott, thank you for everything. Um, and we, we'd done this course and, you know, I, I, obviously I was in it and met some fabulous people, but you come out of it and you're ready, you're ready to go. Like, you're like, you know, give me Shakespeare, give me the National, give, give me whatever you want to fry, I'm ready, give me Hollywood, I'm ready, you're just stepping out. But like, there's 3,000 other people around the country that are doing the same thing at the same time, do you know what I mean? Like, they're all stepping out, going, I'm ready, I'm ready, and you've got this kind of, you've got, you've got a, a, an energy to succeed, but then there's also this thing of where uh, there's a lot of people doing the same thing as you at the same time, right? So, we all wanted agents, me, me, me well, all, all of us, we all wanted agents, we all wanted to move forward, we all wanted to be, you know, as successful as we could be. But it wasn't coming, obviously, like, it's not like agents turn up at the college. Like, if you're at a big college or if you're at a, a big drama school, then agents will turn up and, you know, there, there is a possibility of you getting on their books and you going straight, you know, straight into professional work. But majority of the time, that doesn't happen. So, after... After I'd done college, um, me and two friends that was in the uh, youth theatre of Theatre Royal, Theatre Royal's youth theatre uh, at Stratford, um, we'd basically finished at the same time um, and we was frustrated young actors and we was just like, you know what, what are we going to do? We ain't got no agent, you know, it's hard to tout for an agent, you've just come out of college, we've just, you know, we've just learned about that whole process, so what are we going to do? So we decided to do our own show. At like 18, 19, we decided to do our own show. We, we wrote it, uh, we directed it, we produced as much as we could of it. Um, and it was called DRD Productions at Stratford, uh, Stratford Theatre Raw. And it was myself, um, another actor called Darren Hart, who's in Big Up Charlie right now uh, with Idris on Netflix. Big Up Darren, Big Up Yourself, Hartman. And another friend of ours called John. When we'd done the first show, DRD Productions, there was a producer called Deborah, Deborah Sarte. Big up Debs. Big up Debs. Um, I got so much love for Debs. Debs was a supporter of young talent. She was a curator of young talent. She, she was always looking for the next thing. She, she was a, a broker of diversity as well. Wherever I've been, whenever, wherever she has been, she has always tried to bring in as much flavor and as much culture and as much color as possible, you know? Um, um, so she, she was on the first DRD show. Um, she, helped, she helped us come in. She was on the first DRD show that we'd done professionally at Stratford Theatre Roll for a sold out. You know, sold out there uh, where you know people were you know have it, were trying to sneak in. People were standing up at the sides of the theater. I don't know who let who in where because of health and safety and palaver, but people were ramming to get into the show. Um, it went down fantastically. Well, I, I say fantastic apart from apart from Debs's bit. So Debs was up in. I'll tell you a quick quick story about Deborah. Deborah was up in the lighting booth during this time. Now Debs. Like I say, she helped with everything, you know, she helped support, we, we had set that, you know, John ended up painting, um, me and Darren would take rehearsals with the acts and kind of, because we formed our own show around our acts and stuff like that, and, and Debs was working the lights and, and the board upstairs, and it came to this point during the show, and um, Luckily, there was a singer on that we knew and loved and trusted, like knew the game inside out. Her name is Ruan. And fa fantastic, her voice is like chocolate. It's, it's super smooth and super silky. And um, she came on and she was, singing, she was singing a song. I can't actually remember what song it is because as she was singing this song, Deborah's up in the lighting booth. We don't know this. M me, Darren, and John were just on stage. Some of us are looking from the wings. Some of us are getting the next bit ready, whatever we're doing, do you know what I mean? We're, but we're, we're on the game. Like, and you've got to remember, this is our first professional show, the three of us, 
So everything we're checking. So we're going back, we're checking our own running order. Right, we've done that. Cool, fantastic, cool. What's next, what's next? What's, okay, get that, get that, get that. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So we're, we're super, super on it, super hyped, super focused, but it means a lot to us. It means a, a real big deal to us. Ruan singing a song, and Deb's up in the lighting booth, has put her foot down, and there's a red button on the floor, which is basically the, the, kill, the kill switch for the lights. So she puts her foot on, on, she steps on the button by accident, kills all of the lights in the theatre dead. Ruan is left on stage in pitch darkness, in pitch blackness, right? And the girl carries on singing, yeah? The girl carries on singing. Now, big up to Ruan for carrying on singing, right? So she carries on singing. Now, we're behind stage, we're like, what was that? What just happened? We're running back. We're going forth. We're running back. We're going forth. We don't know what's happening. Then, what? We, obviously, we don't know. We have found out later. But what has happened is, like, Deb stepped on it, and then she, they're trying to reboot the whole system. Now, the lights were set. They're, they're preset in order of the of the show and of and of the acts and of all of those things. They're all preset. It's all different. We've done it. We've dealt with it. We've spent a long time on the tech dealing with this. She's killed it. So now, the lighting guy and her, they're trying to reboot, and when I tell you reboot lights, I'm talking about like the little dibby dibby kind of really bad kind of dimly lit uh, ceiling lights and stuff like that. They, they're booting them up, and then a little bit, we get, we're getting general cover up, and then little bit by little bit, like we get a little bit of light up. Ruan, bless her, as the, 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 the lights came up, she carried on singing, she sang the whole song. Me and, I remember me and Darren came out, we bust some joke about, um, you know, not paying the electric man or the electric meter, we need to put 50 pence in the electric meter. We bust joke with it, we rolled with it, we carried on the show. There was not one person that clocked that there was a mistake. Not one person in the audience clocked that it was a mistake. They all thought, because of our show and the way that we done it, they all thought it was part of the show. And the premise of the show, I think, was like, I don't know, I think it was like save our theater or save the youth center or save something. So they thought basically that the lights had cut in the youth centre because somebody had cut out the money. They made up their own story, they made up their own through line to get us back on track. Like they didn't even clock. So we're all stressing and we get back on and we're fine, we, we, we carry on and we move on. But at the end of the show we're like, what the hell happened, what the hell happened? Nobody clocked. Not one person in the audience clocked. They was like, oh no, I thought it was part of the show. It was like, alright, cool, we got away with that one. But then when we saw Dead, we're like, Dead! What's going on? She's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm almost funny. I, I didn't know what to do. And then we had panic and so we've got a good relationship with Debs. Um, I've got a good relationship with Debs. Me and the boys have got a good relationship with Debs. So I think it was like after that, I think it was like five years later, something like that, that um, she obviously she remembered me and she she got in touch. Uh, she was developing this show called E20 um, for EastEnders, and it was an EastEnders spin-off for the online community, for the internet. And uh, she wanted me to come in and read for the part of Fatboy. So I was like, okay, fine, cool, no problem. Um, I hadn't seen Debs in a little while, so I had a little face fuzz at the time. <laughs> um, I had a little face fuzz, so I'm like, you know, I'm gonna keep this. <laughs> I'm gonna keep this, you know, she's, you know, she ain't seen me in a while, you know, give her something different. So we get in the room and like, you, I, you gotta remember, I don't think, I'm trying to think just to make sure, but I don't think I got a script before I got there and I done a script reading, the whole script, yeah? So I didn't have a clue what the character was, what the breakdown was, what the script itself was. So I had no time to practice anything. I just I had to, there might have been a premise, there might have been a breakdown of the character. There might have been, there had to have been, I don't know. I'm trying to think, think I can't remember that far. But from what I remember, I remember just kind of going in there and like going, okay, cool. I read the first couple of, I read the first page of Fatboy and I was like, okay, I, I know who this guy is. Like, I know what you want, you know? And E20 was really, really special because they had, I want to say between 15 and 19 young writers. From, from the ends, from the bits, from all different parts of London, um, some slightly from outside London, but they brought all these people in to write a young people show um, for the internet. So 
they didn't they didn't rely on EastEnders uh, writers. They or want EastEnders regular writers. They wanted a new flavor. Their idea was we want to see what uh, these young people of the square what they're seeing, what their eyeline is seeing, you know, what their perspective of the square is. It, almost as if, if you was a fan of the show, you'd see these bouncing around in the background, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't clock, you know? But now, the tables have turned, and now you're seeing it from their perspective, like you're seeing what they're seeing, you know, you, how they react to Phil, or how they react to Ian, and, 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 and these type of things. So, so I was like, okay, cool. Um, so like I say, uh, I went and read, read the first page. I kind of got the gist of it. I knew some of the slang, even though they were young, um, some of the slang was a bit, still, still a bit iffy. Most of it, 99% of it was fantastic on point. You know what I mean? On point. But there's different slang for different areas, right? And so, so somebody from maybe, I don't know, North London might say a certain slang word in a certain way where I'm East London born and bred. There's the rhythm of it or the way in which it was said wouldn't have been said that way. So I would change real, real tiny bits um, when it came down to E20, just, just little bits. Um, but like I say, so we've done the reading. Um, after the first page, I got the vibe of facts and, and, and what they wanted with facts. Um, the reading finished and then we sit there talking with, 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 the, with, with the writers and it was basically for the writers, it wasn't really an audition or anything like that, it was, it was basically like, um, we're working the script for the writers, see where we can develop. So, yeah, we spoke to the writers for a little bit afterwards um, and then it was, it was done and as I was leaving, I remember, because I was still on a hike, so I just remember leaving and she remember, yo, just remember! Who's facts, yeah? Who's facts is right here. Don't forget it, yeah? Because you know nobody else can play facts, right? You know this, innit? You know this, innit? Don't forget it, boys, girls. All right, I'll see you real soon. I done, I done. I don't know what foolishness I done, but I done some foolishness with some energy that was still in the fat boy kind of way. You know, I've just done the reading, so I was still in that vibe. So I done it in that way. Came out, that was a Wednesday. By Friday, I got the call to say, yeah, we'd like you to come in for an audition. But Ricky from, from Devs, but Ricky, make sure you shave. I was like, <laughs> all right, cool. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. So I, um, I, I went in, um, when was it, the next week? Um, probably like a Tuesday, I think it was. I went in, done the audition. The audition process is mad. I tell you, for, for any young actor out there that, that is going up for an audition in a show that you know, yeah? In a show that you know and love, it is mad when you hit that rehearsal room, uh, that audition room. It's just because there's so, much, so many people that want it in the same room. And, you know, um, I'll tell you a quick story about the room. So the green room, like I say, there's, there's a lot of different energy in that green room. I'm, I'm normally really, really calm when it comes to the green room. My, my philosophy is this. If, it's, if the role is meant for me, it will be mine. If it's meant for you, then wicked, good luck. I wish you all the best. I don't have no hate on you or, or no kind of side eye with you about taking my job or you got it or whatever. I'm, I'm not that guy. I'm just not that guy. I just make sure I come in and do what I do, yeah? Because nobody can do what I do. The same way nobody can do what you do, yeah? Always remember that. So, um, anyway, so I've come in and I can see the energy. It's like, it's really kind of closed off and kind of, you know, people are, you know, when you, when you see somebody that really wants something like this, you know, it's, I don't want to call it desperate, I want to call it, because it's, it's something different to that. It's, it was almost like clingy, it was almost like needy, it was almost, there was a different energy. There was, let me just say that. Just before I go in, I, I see a friend, friend of mine from, from Holby. Now, I, you know, I give them a hug, give them some love, you know, yada, yada, yada. And now, I know how that can look, yeah? So, you know, from somebody sitting in there, they could be like, oh, he knows her or, you know, he knows him. Maybe he's connected, you know, maybe there's something going on here. There wasn't, it was just love, right? So, said hello, come into the room, like I say, different type of energy. Now I sit down and I'm like, you know what? Just concentrate on you, like I always do. You stay calm, I felt the energy, but just stay calm, concentrate on you and what you've got to do. I'm like, okay, cool. And so I start looking at the script. They've given us, a, um, um, a script on the day. So I started looking at the script, I started breaking down, it was full of slang. 
So, which is fine for me. It's no problem. So I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I'm seeing what I'm finding out some bits and pieces. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. Now there's there's some different actors in the room. Like there's some body beautifuls, yeah. Like like they're just built like they're built differently. Um, and then there, you know, there's loads of different races in the room. Do you know what I mean? Um, all for the part of, of, of a fat boy. There's a, a, a lot of white guys. There's maybe two black guys, and then there's maybe me as the mixed race one. Uh, yeah, I think that was it. Um, and then there was a couple of others for other roles and stuff like that. But so anyway, so um, I'm there and I start reading my scripts and I'm going through it and I'm like, okay, cool, 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 cool. And then this one boy in the corner um, kind of goes, you know, sorry, sorry, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can I can I just ask a question? So everybody looks up. Everybody looks up at this guy. He's like, what is you at? Like, what is you at? I'm reading this script and I, and I just, what's going on? My you at? I was like, I just don't know what's, I don't know what, and I was like, sorry, bro, do you mean my you? Is that, is that what you mean? It was like, oh, uh, well, yeah, maybe. It's like, yeah, because. My, my you, as in, it's like my youth, as in my younger, as in like the young one, like that's what he's referring to in, in that point. Oh, oh, okay. Now at that point, I had this massive surge of effort in me. I was just like, you know what, effort? I'm going to take this role. I'm going to take it. I'm going to own it, I'm taking it home. Because if I can sit here in a room where one man's asking what you at is, yeah, and I don't get this, then there's something wrong. I might have to hang up the gloves or something. You know what I mean? There is something wrong. So it just gave me, I mean, I gave, I, it, it confused me because I thought whoever's coming in for this role would have had some type of street knowledge, yeah? So for him to be like, what's my you at? I was like, I, it just, it was, it, it just kind of, I don't know what it was in me, but it just, whoop, all this confidence came in me. And I was like, well, nobody's going to know this script like me. Like, no, I, looked, I looked around in the room, I was like, nobody's going to know this script like me. So I went in and I just, when, I, when, I, when they called me in, I went in and, and I tore it down. When I tell you I tore it down, I tore it down. I knew half of it off book. Everybody else was reading, I knew half of it off. Sometimes I was improvising and just going off and kind of carrying on with my slang. Because I knew the energy of the character. So done really, really well in, in, in that audition. They took me back into the room. They even brought me in to read for Leon as well. So it's like, yeah, Ricky, can you come in as well and just read for Leon? I was like, yeah, okay, cool. So I just totally flipped it, totally switched it. I didn't know what Leon was about at that point. I was like, because I was just so focused on what Fats was, this is what you've asked me to do, cool. But I had no clue what, 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 what Leon was about, really. I, from the reading, I'd, I'd known what his character was, but I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to play this at this particular point. So I'm like, okay, okay, get your brain on, shake it up. Okay, cool, 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 cool. He's a lover, you know, he, he loves his girl, you know, he's, there's loads of different things going on. Like, he likes his clothes, he's got the, the you know, he's, he's thinking about his hair. So all this is like, like, this is 30 second process. Like, I'm like, okay, 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 okay. Plus, you've got to read it and then know it and then probably pick out the one, two words that are, you know, that are awkward or kerfuffly or whatever the case may be and practice those, okay, kerfuffily, kerfuffily, kerfuffily. Okay, good, we're good, we got that in. And then I had to go back in, read for Leon, with the guy that played Leon, uh, originally. So, um, yeah, with the guy that played Leon originally, man. Um, Sam, at water. Uh, it, it, it was quite funny, actually, because he, he'd, been playing, he'd been playing Leon uh, for, I think, maybe two groups. They were doing it in rounds. They were taking us in in four. They'd done it individually and then they took us in in groups of four because the, the E20 was a group of four. So we, we went in and he was playing Leon in the first read. Mercy was playing Mer Mercy. And I don't think we had... Oh, I can't remember whether Zsa, Zsa was there or not at the time. But, but basically there was four of us reading him. Like I said, they've called, called me back in to read for Leon. So... The guy that's playing, Sam, who's playing, playing Leon, who kind of like looked as I walked into the room, I was kind of like, uh, and he told me later, he was like, bro, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to happen. Because I thought I had that until you walked in and they called you back in and I was like, what's happening here? What's happening here? 
you know. Um, <laughs> fun times, fun times. Uh, and then I think it was like two, three days later, got the call, we got the job. And E20 was like a fantastic experience because unlike EastEnders where you've got, um, you know, loads of different writers and loads of different directors on any one day or, you know, uh, you're shifting weeks and you're shifting times. E20, we've done it in order and we've done it with the same director for two weeks and the same camera team for two weeks. So we got to, re it was almost like theatre. We got to really understand each other, really, you know, um, know how we all work together. Um, they allowed me to improvise. They trusted me as well. Deb's, De Deborah obviously knew me from before and had trust in me, but none of the, these rest, none, none of the rest of the people did. Like, so the, the, the director that was working on the day, he didn't know what I was really about, you know, or what I was going to bring, or whether I was going to go too much with slang, or whether I was going to be offensive with slang. Now, the one thing that I wasn't going to do was do that. You know, I wasn't going to put myself in a bad position, or put the people that I'm representing in a bad light. You know what I mean? I didn't want to do none of that. I knew growing up watching EastEnders, what the audience is, what the audience expects, because my mum is a big part of that and I grew up watching it, like I say. Um, so I knew that Fats couldn't have anything that was too current slang-wise. So if it was within the year, two years, even up to three years, if it was three years new slang, I wouldn't use it just because there would be no reference to it outside of London. Stuff like Wagwan is like almost universal. You can go to Birmingham, they say like Wagwan, like, you know what I mean, you know. So there's certain things, and, and it, uh, there are certain words that if you didn't know that I introduced, then I always got the other character to explain it. So I would say, you know, I'm feeling your garms, do you know what I mean, saying along those lines. And they'd be like, like, somebody, another character would be like, garms, what are you talking about, garms? And then the character that I was speaking to would go, he's talking about my clothes, which, which, I would orchestrate so that there would be some type of understanding, you know? And to show as well that slang ain't so mystic, it's not so cryptic. It's, if, if you take some time, then you can understand it, you can be a part of it, you know? And that was one thing with Dot as well. When I was working with Dot, like, you know, the writers used to write her slang, which is often not wrong, but in the wrong place and in the wrong context of what they was trying to get across. So she would always come to me and be like, Ricky, okay, I've had some slang. Could you have a look at it for me, darling? And I'd be like, yeah, of course, Mrs. B, let's go. Like, do you know what I mean? Because, you know, her name is June Brown, so she is Mrs. B anyway. So Mrs. B on set, Mrs. B outside of set. So I'd sit down and then I'd switch up some words and I'd teach her, teach her some slang words and stuff like that. And, you know, it was amazing. And again, if I ever said anything... Um, that needed explaining, another character would explain it. And sometimes Dot would do it, you know. Sometimes Dot would explain to um, another one of the, you know, the, the, the older ladies um, that, would, that would go around at that time. There was loads of different, there was, there was a little Golden Girls click at the time. So, you know, those others that were, hap that, that were there at the time, she would explain to them in character. She'd be like, oh no, he means this. And, oh no, he means, but Arthur, can you pull up your trousers? You know, she'd do stuff like that. She was awesome. My contract for EastEnders, for the main line, was uh, supposed to be short, I think. I, I, I want to say three months. I want to say three months on the main show. Um, it was basically... My, my, my contract was basically for the online and a couple of crossovers, crossover episodes. And they do crossover ep episodes to kind of introduce the main audience to these characters and then hopefully you'd come over and see us online. Um, and that happened, you know, like E20 is, I think it's still one of the, the highest watched, viewed, what, all the stats, uh, online soaps, you know, it started this whole clique of online soaps and kind of, you know, stuff that you could, continuing drama that you could do online at the time that we done it. It, it, it won awards, um, you know, for breaking barriers. Like the way that it, it we spoke to our, uh, our audience, our, our young audience, and some of the parents as well that used to watch it took a lot from it, um, as well as the young people. So 
there, there was a lot of goodness that came from E20. Um, and the crossover episodes, my, my, my uh, Fats didn't really get that much in the crossover, crossover episodes. He would normally, <clears throat> he would normally get like a, a line at the end of a end of a scene, or he'd get a moment at the end of a scene, or he'd be in a group scene. And all of this time, I was just like, "Stay calm. Your time will come." Like, all, all this is is just tests. You know, these are all tests. So yeah, I was just. You know, saying to myself, your time will come, just stay calm. And it did, little by little bit. They started giving me more, they started giving me like a page of stuff. Uh, then it was like, okay, two pages. And then it was like, okay, you've got monologues. Um, and if, if, if you remember, I, those fans will remember. Those fans will remember, those that remember. But one of the biggest things that happened for Fats in, in the first year was... Um, him, Jar Jar, Mercy, Lucy, Peter Bill. I think that was it. We all went to the country in the Fat Boy van, in the Fat Mobile. And this was like a week of episodes where I was going to be on every day. Um, they was going to follow this storyline every day throughout the country. There was a love triangle between Leon and Lucy and Jar Jar. And, um, you know, Fats was around on that time um, doing what Fats does. But during that week, there was a monologue where Peter basically went missing. Um, Fats and Peter Bill were best friends. Fats had given Peter Bill a fat boy chain with P on it and called him P-Dog. Um, and, and Peter's gone missing. So I think it was the night before we was drunk. I'm trying, to remember, I'm trying to remember the monologue right now. We was drunk and Fats was driving back and he hit something and I, he thought it was a deer, but now he thinks it could have been Peter. Um, so they're driving to the police. So we're, dri like, so we're going to the police and this monologue, you know, and uh, I had to do this monologue in a police station um, and it was full of slack. And when I was reading it, well, I'd read it, I read, I'd, I'd learned it, but when I was reading it on the way to set, there was things that just didn't sit right. So I just had to, I was switching stuff up before I got there. Like, so we had, a, we had to take a, a coach. We, it wasn't on, on, on Albert Square, it wasn't on set, we was, we was on location. So in the coach, I'm switching stuff up, I'm just making, making the rhythms go nice, you know, giving a, a different word here or there. I then get to this police station where I've got to do this full-on monologue in half slang where the director wants me to talk so much slang that it's like it's incomprehensible like it's it's, it's gibberish almost so he just he's, he's chatting but it makes sense to him but it, 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 it's not supposed to make sense in general and he's supposed to confuse this this country um, police officer so I remember doing it he was like yeah yeah two twos Sang about Peter and Vody, and I hit him, and I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but it, it, it was a really good uh, monologue, really good speech, and it was, that was almost the, the, the pivot point, I mean, a year later, that I ended up winning the NTA. When I won the National Television Award, that's, that's what they showed, that's what they played. It was, it was that one bit, you know, so it shows you how, how massive and how pivotal a time that, that one time was, and I knew it at the time as well. And, and, and that's another thing, as an actor, you've got to know when you're, well, you've got to take every moment and you have to take every opportunity and you have to be 100% all of the time. But this was a, uh, you know, a very specific uh, part of time where I was just like, you know what, I've got to take this opportunity. This is a test, I deserve a test. I've got to take this opportunity and I have to exceed. It's almost like GCSEs, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's almost like an exam. They're testing you, can you do this? Can you learn it? Can you perform it? Can you execute? Yeah, with, with all of the subtleties, with all of the, the nuances and all of those things, can you deal with it? Yeah, okay, cool, let's go, you know? Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was a major part and I think that kind of, that got me on the road to earning my contracts on EastEnders and, and, being, a, and being a regular. Um, after those three months I was on the, on the main show, they said, 
they said basically a year. So which we, we, they say like three months with a three month extension and then three months with a three month extension. It was a year. So they said to me a year. I said, all right, then cool. Wicked, let's do that, let's sign up. Um, and year on year, you know, I was, like I said, I was only supposed to be there three months, six months tops, and I ended up being there six years. You know, so um, I rinsed that one. <laughs> I rinsed that one. Yeah, man, I, you know, made sure I went to work. Um, how much input did I have on shaping Fatboy's character? Well, I would say, I would say a lot. Um, when I first came to the table, they had the character of, of Fats uh, based out, but you know, I had to take it on and I had to take it, take it as far as I could take it. Um, I knew the character. We knew, we, we knew the character. He, he, he was a... He wanted to be part of street culture. He wanted to be part of street life, but he just lived outside of it. Um, he wanted to, you know, he wanted to be part of the road uh, and wanted to hustle, but he, both of his parents had good jobs, you know, and, you know, if he wanted a DS or a Game Boy or, or whatever it was or a new PlayStation game, then it was no problem. Like, it, it, it got gotten, you know, he got it. Um, he was very intelligent as well. He was a problem solver. He was very technical, fats. Um, and what I, what I ended up doing was I ended up like reshaping loads of different things. So firstly, where he was from, they, I think they said like wood green or something like that on, on the script. And I was just like, that made no sense to me. Now it's funny because, you know, Forest Gate is where I'm born and bred. Yeah. So Forest Gate is almost like the, the, the you know, Forest Gate is, is mixed. It's got a bit of rough and a bit of smooth. But right next door to Forest Gate is Wanstead, which is super slick. It, Wanstead Flats is like, you know, um, it's not like a tower block of flats. What they mean by flats is like flat ground. Like they've got grass, they've got fields, they've got forest, you know, and then they've got some really lovely expensive houses in Wanstead and a lot of, you know, really um, like uh, high profile professionals li live there. You know, you've got doctors, you've got lawyers, you've got business people living in Wanstead. And I just felt that Wanstead was more appropriate, you know. Um, in my head, I was like, well, this boy's from Wanstead and he's going to school in Forest Gate, you know. That was my head. That's how I tried to switch it up. So he was always, like, he was a lover of the culture, but at the beginning, it was almost like he wanted to be a part of it. He wasn't a part of it. He wanted to be a part of it. And there are those characters. There are those people out there that are just attracted to something. And, you know, start embracing whatever that culture is. Sometimes it's like Chinese culture, you know. Everyone, you know, you come in your, your, your Chinese silk top and you're reading manga and, you know, you start, like, drawing in Chinese characters. You know, people do it. The houses are full of it. It doesn't matter. Um, but I just knew, I, I just thought that once it would be, it's still East London, it's close to everything that, um, that, that we're asking of this character. So I switched that up. Also the kind of origin of where Fatboy got his name from. So I, it's straight away, <clears throat> I remember when they, when they asked me about the character, when I, when I got the job, um, I had to have a, uh, an interview in EastEnders with the big boss. And I remember them saying to me at the end, do, do you mind if we, like, what do you think about the, the, the name Fatboy? Like, what do you think about it? Like, do you mind that we call you Fats? Do you mind that we call you Fatboy? And me, truthfully, I didn't care, I didn't care. Listen, I'm just like, everything inside of me, truth speaking, everything inside of me was just like, just give me the job, just give me the job. Call me whatever you want, just give me the job. Just give me the contract, give me the job. Just give me the job, just give me the job. I don't wanna, just, 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 just give me the pen, give me the job, just give me the job. Don't care what you call me, give me the job. And that's how I felt, I was like, just give me the job and I'll deal with it, do you know what I mean? I'll deal with it. So um, they gave me the job. And then I remember like two weeks later, phoning them going, guys, you see this name? You see, you see the name Fatboy, yeah? Um, it's just that I just had a thought, you know, uh, you know, it, it's fine for now, but maybe like, you know, in, in a couple of weeks time when people are shouting Fats or Fatboy on the street, it might be a bit, so how do you feel about changing it? And they came out and it was like, you know what, Ricky, we, we kind of, we've already kind of fell in love with the name Fatboy and, and how you've played it and, and what it is. And, you know, so like, if you don't mind, we're just going to roll with it. And I was like, yeah, I don't care. Let's just roll with it. We'll roll with it. Just means I've got to go to gym in it. Just means... <laughs> just means, I got, you know, just got to make sure I look after myself. All right, cool. So we rolled with it. Was there any storylines that I wasn't happy with? Uh, yes and no. 
you, you can't really be unhappy with storylines in EastEnders. You know, it's almost like you get, you, you get given what you get given and it's up to you to kind of make the best of it. Um, storylines is different, you know. So sometimes there's certain storylines that I think don't fit, but then you have to kind of take on board what they're saying, which is this is what we're giving you. Like this is, this is what your storyline is. So let's try and work it. Let's try and shape it so that it does fit. Or we can put in a reason that it did happen or that did go that way, you know? Uh, one, of, one of my biggest things were like, why doesn't anybody move, like learn the lesson? But it's hard to ask that question in EastEnders because a lot of people will repeat their mistakes and that's where the drama is, right? So, for instance, Max were, was a serial cheater, right? So, if he ever learned his lesson, we wouldn't get that, oh, Max, do you know what I mean? So, I totally understand that. So, um, when they used to come to me, when they did used to come to me with storylines, well, firstly, majority of the time they don't. They just give you the script, okay? You look at the script, you go, okay, 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 here's what I can change, here's what I can fix, okay, 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 that makes sense for my character, and you go on. Um, but when stuff did come in, um, you know, you, you guys speak to them, you guys speak to the office, and you try and just adapt it so that it makes sense some way, shape, or form to you, for you. Sometimes when you've been in there, for a long time as well, those reasons really matter because you've become attached. You've, you've put bricks in place, you know. Th these are the foundations of facts. Now, some, a scene or a script will come in that kind of totally disregards all those pillars that we've just built. So it's like, well, what happens now? Why are they disregarded? I need to know that. I need to know that, you know. Um, so those... I only ever, 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 ever went up to the office very, very rarely. Very rarely. I remember at the beginning it was mostly about language because they wanted me to go up to the office if I changed slang. But then it became so stupid. I was changing it every day. I was changing it through four different scripts. You want to sit here with a, a writer and kind of go through all the script changes that I've made so that you can what, rewrite it. I, I didn't know what was going on. So I just made sure that wherever I put my stuff, like I'd done it in a place where it wouldn't affect nobody. Beginning and, end, beginning and ends of lines, I would keep clean, yeah? I, I might swap the words around just for a different rhythm at the beginning of the line, but beginning of the line and end of the line, I'd keep the same, and in the middle, I'd do what I, you know, I'd add a little bit here or there, and, you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, just keep it moving. Don't let negativity drag you down. Don't, sometimes people would jab you to get, a, provoke you to get a reaction, because they want you to go to that place. You know, sometimes I walk too many times with a smile on my face. Sometimes I'm too happy. You know, sometimes, you know, I give too much love. So they're like, who's this guy? Like, well, what's he happy about? All right, cool. Well, let's, let's shake it up a little bit. You know, some people don't like it. But don't be defined or swayed by what other people's agendas are. Take that breath. Take that breath and, and stay on your journey. Thank <laughs> you.